Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, I want to say it's my great honor to have another super brain in the Meet the Doctor series. Dr. Robert Kainer is somebody who I admire as a person. I admire his patient care. And just about everybody I know that has ever met Dr. Kainer says how nice he is also. Okay, so this guy is one of the greats for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to have Bill Vick here tonight who is kind of like an alien that has come down from space and somehow is sort of a superpower that we're going to try to channel some of his energy tonight. Um, before we start, I want to just say one thing. For all the people that have been voting for Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness in the, I'm not going to mention their name, blog contest, okay? I want to thank you all so much. It means so much to me. You guys have been stellar. Uh, in terms of getting in there every day for six weeks and I know I've been harassing you and you guys have been so strong Did we fall into second place? Yes. Does it look like uh, we're not going to take the top prize? Yes. Did we lose? Absolutely not. Um, what we did for the past six weeks and I saw you guys every night signing on calling each other out uh, We have been together for six weeks and I've seen you all and I appreciate you all and trust me the webinars will go on Okay um, that thousand bucks is not going to make or break our webinar series. We still will be here for you. And based on the energy we've had for the next six weeks, we are going to take this to new levels in 2015, and we have something to build on. So now, Dr. Kaner, you said it best when I saw you at the Cornell uh, piece that we did for the, the, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Education Day. Why don't people understand interstitial lung diseases and you said because they're they're complicated they have complicated names um, ladies and gentlemen this is going to be complex tonight it's a complicated topic and we're going to try to break it down as simply as possible when people hear things like asthma emphysema chronic bronchitis which are the obstructive diseases I think most people generally have an idea of what we're talking about a picture pops into their head but if you say the words interstitial lung disease to people, I think they kind of think like, huh, or like a big cloud goes over their head, what are we talking about? So just in the interest of getting us off on the right foot, can you explain what we're talking about when we talk about interstitial lung diseases? Sure, Noah, and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. My pleasure. Um, interstitial lung disease occurs in the gas exchanging part of the lung. So it's different from the airways diseases that you just mentioned. So those diseases occur in the, in the bronchial tubes, the airways that conduct air from your mouth, from the atmosphere, into the substance of the lung. So deep inside the lung, in the alveolar spaces, that's where gas exchange actually occurs. So that's where the interface is between the capillaries that bring carbon dioxide to the lung, release it, and then um, the red cells take on oxygen in the atmosphere. So in the gas exchanging part of the lung, um, there is a structure. And the structure is composed of an alveolus, which is the airspace. And within the alveolus, most of it is in the normal lung, is mostly air. Um, but it's surrounded by a very thin um, structure, which is called the alveolar wall. And the alveolar wall contains um, epithelial cells, which are cells that line the airspace, and pulmonary capillaries that are just big enough to accommodate one red blood cell at a time. And then there's a connective tissue scaffolding that holds that structure together. In the interstitium, is the space in between those cells um, where there is connective tissue. Those are proteins and proteoglycans and glycoproteins that form the actual structure of the gas exchanging part of the lung. So interstitial lung diseases are centered on those alveolar walls and the structures um, that hold the gas exchanging part of the lung together which is very different in anatomy than the airway. So a lot of times people will um, compare the alveoli to, let's say, um, a bunch of grapes. So if we think of it as a bunch of grapes, is the, al is the interstitium the outside of the grape and in between the grape, or is it part of the grape? Well, if you think, if you think of the um, 
a cluster of alveoli is a cluster of grapes. So right. that, that whole gas exchanging unit is called the a sinus. And the, the interstitium would be more like the skin of the grape. So that's where Perfect. it gives it its um, tensile strength, its ability to maintain its structure. And that would be analogous to the, the alveolar wall. Gotcha. So the skin of the grape is getting thicker? Right. And we're getting less air in each grape. Is that accurate? Right. But the physiology turns out to be a little bit more complicated. So the, the simple explanation is just what you said. If, if you have this very thin membrane that allows oxygen to go from the airspace of the lung into the pulmonary capillary, the way the normal structure is, um, the distance that oxygen has to travel to get across that membrane is very short. And it makes sense that if that membrane gets thicker, the distance for diffusion is longer, so the process is going to be less efficient. But it turns out to be more complex. So typically, in people that have interstitial lung disease, as you know very well, their oxygen saturation at rest may be normal or near normal. But it's when they exercise that their oxygen saturation drops. So the reason for that is that the um, the pulmonary circulation you can you could model as um, a series of parallel pipes, and it doesn't really have a lot of um, excess capacity. And when you exercise, your entire cardiac output has to go through your pulmonary circulation. Right. And when you exercise, your cardiac output has to increase dramatically. So in a normal person, there's plenty of capacity to allow that increased cardiac output to go through the pulmonary circulation. As you have a progressive interstitial lung disease, mm -hmm. where there's scarring in the gas exchanging part of the lung, and you're, and you're losing more and more of those pipes, the only way you can maintain cardiac output is for the velocity of the red cells to increase. So they start whizzing through the remaining pulmonary capillaries even faster and faster. Now, the red blood cell is normally in the pulmonary capillary for about a quarter of a second. Mm -hmm. So by the time it goes from the beginning of the capillary to the end of the capillary, it's completely saturated with oxygen. But if you lose enough of your pulmonary circulation, the red blood cells may have to go so fast during exercise when you're increasing your cardiac output that they can't become fully saturated with oxygen at the end of the capillary. So in that situation, you have exercise-induced oxygen desaturation. And the more capillaries you lose, the worse it gets. And that's what happens as interstitial lung disease progresses, and that's why you may need large amounts of oxygen in order to exercise to compensate for that impaired physiology. So that's a, a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, it really, it, it makes things a lot clearer when you say that. Now, let's jump right, let's stay with that and, and talk about something as to how do people use their oxygen. So we started seeing uh, pulmonary fibrosis in interstitial patients in 95 when I was at NYU. And we would see people whose saturations were so low. I mean like 85 to 80 percent at rest with exercise going way into the 70s. And they were often under oxygenated because you know it's hard to get, you can't get a prescription for 100 percent O2. But we started exercising people with 100 percent O2. Do you advise, how do you advise people to use their oxygen? And for example, a lot of the home units don't have enough oxygen to even keep someone supplied. So what do you say to those people? Well, my general philosophy for people with interstitial lung disease, and I'm not talking about COPD, I'm specifically okay. talking about interstitial lung disease, because COPD can have a different set of problems associated with excessive oxygen administration. But in interstitial lung disease, that's not a problem. So in interstitial lung disease, you should use as high an oxygen concentration as you need to keep your saturation in a, in a reasonable range. By that I mean above 88% saturation. And if it takes six liters or 12 liters to do that when you walk, then that's how much you need. And if your home unit 
uh, or your portable concentrator, your portable oxygen tank doesn't provide that, you need something stronger and you should get it. And you should get it. So for a lot of patients, like we have patients who we have to exercise on 15 liters with a mask. So are you essentially saying that patient is homebound? Because what happens a lot of times, as I'm sure you know, patients are prescribed oxygen, okay, they will wear it around the house, but when they need to go out, they leave it home. What do you say to those patients? They really need a portable system because the, the time that you need the oxygen the most is when you're walking, when you're exercising. And so um, sometimes it's a process of working with your oxygen supplier and your physician and uh, the person who you're doing exercise with will be in the best position to advise your physician about how much oxygen it takes for you to perform different activities to optimize a plan that is customized for you and your physiologic needs. Can you talk a little bit about some of the effects of being uh, of having too low oxygen. So what, what are the dangers? Because people ask this all the time. So what is the danger of being at 85% or 84%? Well, if you, if you have coronary artery disease and your, the blood supply to your heart or any other organ is already compromised, that's immediately a problem because you're not delivering enough oxygen to supply the needs for that organ. But even in the absence of any um, cardiovascular disease, when your oxygen saturation is low, the pulmonary circulation has a mechanism to match ventilation and perfusion, which is called ventilation-perfusion matching. Okay. And that serves very well to divert blood flow from areas of the lung that are not ventilated. For example, when you have a pneumonia and part of your lung is completely filled up with pus, you don't want, you don't want to deliver deoxygenated blood there because it won't become oxygenated because the air spaces are filled up with something. So that mechanism is called reflex vasoconstriction and that helps with diseases that affect part of the lung. But if you have a disease that affects most of the lung and your oxygen saturation is very low, that reflex vasoconstriction causes constriction everywhere. And that can lead to, so that increases the vascular resistance in the pulmonary circulation, and that leads to secondary pulmonary hypertension, which means that the pressure in the pulmonary arterial circulation is elevated. When that happens, the right ventricle has to pump harder to get blood through the pulmonary circulation across that increased resistance. So it can do that and compensate to some extent but eventually it won't be able to keep up with the resistance and it will begin to fail. So it will dilate and the function of the right ventricle will begin to be adversely affected. And as that progresses, it will lead to right-sided congestive heart failure and eventually to death if nothing is done about it. So this is a very serious problem that we're talking about. One of the things I, I want to just ask you also is, so how does that oxygen delivery differ for somebody, let's say, who does have COPD? How, so you mentioned for the IPF or the interstitial patient, as much as they need to stay saturated. What about the COPD patient? Well, the COPD patient is different because some patients with COPD um, have an increased carbon dioxide level in their blood. And they're oxygen, um, their carbon dioxide sensor in their brain um, may be altered so that they don't respond to oxygen uh, the way a normal person would. So what I mean is, there's some people with COPD who, when they're given excessive supplemental oxygen, will slow down their ventilation and their carbon dioxide level will rise, sometimes to dangerously high levels. So. For COPD, it's important to be to restrict the amount of supplemental oxygen only to the minimal, minimal amount that's absolutely necessary. But in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other interstitial lung diseases, um, the carbon dioxide level is low, it's not high. Mm -hmm. And um, those individuals are not um, sensitive to the 
CO2 raising properties of supplemental oxygen. So in interstitial lung disease, that's not a problem, gotcha. but it can be in COPD. Can you talk about the, the complaints that most patients, well, first of all, how does a patient get to you? Because I know you're not usually the first, like you're a referral for patients who are suspected of having interstitial lung diseases. How do patients get to you? Um, they get to me in a number of different ways. They're usually referred by their pulmonary physician. Um, but sometimes, you know, nowadays they find me on their own by doing an internet search and looking, some people are looking for clinical trials for IPF. Um, they, may, they may see me on the Cornell website. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of times, I mean, I, I hear from people over and over again that they've seen X number of doctors or they've been short of breath for X number of years and they, they don't somehow get diagnosed with IPF or, or interstitial lung disease. Why is that? Well, it, it's actually very common that there's a, there's a long lag between the time people first develop symptoms of interstitial lung disease to actually getting to a diagnosis. And there's a, there's a number of reasons that that happens. One is that um, some people, when they initially develop exertional symptoms, um, write them off to being older or being deconditioned or maybe having a heart problem. And their primary care physician may uh, view it the same way. Or they may do get a cardiac workup, but no one pays any attention to their lungs. Mm -hmm. So um, the diagnosis can be delayed. And then up until recently, at least for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there haven't been any drug treatments available. So I think there was, um, uh, there was sort of a, an attitude among many physicians that, well, there's nothing I can do about the disease anyway, so what's the point of looking for it? Well, now there are a lot of things we can do, so there is a point in looking for it. And um, so I would encourage anyone who has unexplained symptoms of that sort to have them investigated. And so what are the symptoms we're looking for? that, you know, what, what advice would you give to patients, to caregivers, um, if you see this, this, and this, think interstitial lung disease? Well, part of the complexity is that none of the symptoms are specific for interstitial lung disease. So the main symptoms people experience early in interstitial lung disease are cough and um, shortness of breath with exertion. Um, but those aren't specific to interstitial lung disease. Right, they can right. occur with asthma, with COPD, with congestive heart failure. There's a whole host of diseases that can cause those symptoms. So um, it's helpful to have an attentive physician who can try to sort out which category of disease is causing those problems. And that may involve different kinds of testing, including a careful history, a good physical exam, and some basic tests like a chest x-ray, a cardiogram, and so forth. And when there's a suspicion that interstitial lung disease might be the problem, then it's very important to get um, a CAT scan of the chest, and it needs to be done in a very specific way. So for suspected interstitial lung disease, we do uh, what's called a high-resolution CAT scan. So normally, uh, what a CAT scan does is it gives you individual slices of lung tissue. So in a, in a conventional CAT scan of the chest, the slices are about five millimeters in thickness. For interstitial lung disease, we like to do a high resolution CAT scan where the individual slices are about 1.25 millimeters in thickness or even thinner. And we also like to have images made in full expiration. So conventionally for a CAT scan of the chest, you take a deep breath and you hold your breath and they snap all the pictures. But we also like to make images where you blow all the air out and snap all the pictures. And comparing the two um, gives us some idea if there's any of this phenomenon which is called air trapping, which occurs in interstitial lung diseases where there's obstruction of the small airways, mm -hmm. uh, which typically occurs in conditions like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a very important category of interstitial lung diseases. And you, you may not be able to make that diagnosis any other way. Now we have a lot of patients who are 
living in places where they don't have access to a Cornell. Um, and they're, you know, they may, may not even have access to a pulmonary doctor. So what do these people have to do to get a diagnosis? I hear from people all the time that say, I've been, I've been going to my doctor um, and I've been telling them I have a cough, I've been telling them I'm short of breath, and no diagnosis. Well, interstitial lung disease is, is one of those categories that is confusing to a lot of physicians. And it's even confusing to pulmonary specialists because um, it's a minority, it's a small minority of the total um, number of patients that the average pulmonologist would see. And so, um, and as you mentioned in the beginning, it's a very confusing area of medicine, both for diagnosis and for treatment. So, the most expertise in both diagnosis and treatment of interstitial lung disease is really concentrated in academic medical centers. So for people who have those symptoms and they don't have a diagnosis yet, it might be worth their while to make a trip to um, an academic medical center at least to find out what the diagnosis is and then they can be put on the right path back at home with their own doctors. Um, what are some of the causes, and I know a lot of it we don't know the exact cause, but in the interest of helping people avoid things that will either cause the disease or make the disease worse, what are some of the causes and things people should avoid? Well, that advice is going to be different depending on uh, what the cause of a specific person's interstitial lung disease is. So. There are hundreds of causes of interstitial lung diseases. Um, so in order to, to think about the categories of disease, it's helpful to think about those that have a known cause and those that have an unknown cause. Okay. So of those that have a known cause, there are also broad categories. So one broad category is occupational lung disease. So those would be like coal workers pneumoconiosis, asbestosis. Those are generally caused by inorganic dust that people breathe in while they're working over a long period of time. There's another category of diseases of known cause that are caused by breathing in dust, but these are caused by breathing in organic antigens. So that class, that group of diseases is called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And the most common causes for that are either people who have birds as pets or they raise pigeons, so they're exposed to bird antigens constantly, um, or individuals that are sensitive to mold, to fungal spores. And a lot of times people who have this condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis may not even be aware that there's mold in their home. Maybe they had a flood years ago, the water was cleaned up, but they didn't realize that there's mold growing um, behind the drywall or in their basement where they didn't suspect it. And so if we get to that specific diagnosis of hypersensitivity to pneumonitis and we think it was caused by mold, then we, have, we go, have people go back to their home and they may need a professional mold inspection to find out what, what the source of their antigen exposure is. So that would be one example of something that um, someone would need to avoid, but it's a very specific type of interstitial lung disease. Gotcha. And if people can remove the antigen or remove the, the trigger, can they expect to see an improvement in their, in their lung disease or a reversal of their lung disease? It, it depends at what stage the disease is in. So for people that are in a very early stage of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, where the pathology in their lung is predominantly inflammation, then they can expect to see a big improvement in their lung disease. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they have very advanced disease in their lung where there's a lot of scarring and scar tissue that's due to this um, ongoing antigenic exposure, their symptoms and their lung function might stabilize, but it might not get a whole lot better. Okay. Can you take us a little bit from sort of as the progression of the disease? And I, I hate when people talk sort of about the people always talk about the progressive nature of a disease and how it always gets worse and there's nothing you could do. 
Um, so from, let's say, the, the, the mild patient who's just starting to experience symptoms, what are some things that you recommend to them, let's say right off the bat? So you're, you're my doctor, you just are telling me that I do have an interstitial lung disease. How does my treatment plan look? Well, your, your treatment plan looks completely different depending on what the actual diagnosis is. Okay. So the first step is to get to an accurate diagnosis. And for someone with early interstitial lung disease, that may even entail having a surgical lung biopsy. So um, a surgical lung biopsy is done in the operating room by a thoracic surgeon, not a medical pulmonologist like mm -hmm. me. It involves general anesthesia. Now it's done with video cameras making three small holes in the side of the chest. You're in the this hospital. Is this is VATS? This is VATS. Video-assisted uh, thoracic thor surgery? Thor thoracoscopic surgery, okay. right. So um, you're in the hospital for a couple days, and um, it is a general anesthesia, and there's a variable amount of pain in the chest wall after, after the surgery. So um, it's not something that we do unless there's a real need for it. But if there's a real need for it, the importance of having the correct diagnosis up front is really crucial in formulating a treatment plan. And the reason that it's so crucial is because most of the drugs that we prescribe for interstitial lung diseases have a lot of potential side effects. And so exposing someone to potential side effects when you don't know what the disease is or you're not sure um, is really not the best way of handling the situation. So is IPF something that you, is that kind of your most common interstitial disease that you see, or? Well, it, it's the most common interstitial lung disease of unknown etiology. Okay. So besides hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which I mentioned, and IPF, another big category of diseases is those that are associated with systemic connective tissue disorders. Examples of that that are common would be scleroderma, Sjogren's syndrome, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, antisynthetase syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. So those are can all be associated with interstitial lung disease. So that's another big group that we'll see common. And would that lung biopsy tell you the difference between, let's say, the rheumatoid arthritis versus the IPF versus the pneumonitis? Is that what we're, I mean, I'm, and understand people, this is a complex topic. I'm trying to understand, make sure I understand it clearly myself so we can help you understand it. Is that the difference that we're looking for? So I wish the answer to that was a simple yes or okay. no, but it okay. isn't. One of the things that's really complicated about interstitial lung disease is that um, there are a number of histologic patterns. So the pattern of tissue abnormality that the pathologist sees in a lung biopsy. That's one way of classifying the diseases. But the overall disease process and the prognosis is different depending on the setting in which you see that pattern. So, for example, the disease histology that underlies idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, is called the UIP pattern, usual interstitial pneumonia. That pattern can also be seen with rheumatoid arthritis and with scleroderma. But the prognosis is different in the setting of those connective tissue diseases versus idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, even though what the pathologist sees under the microscope looks exactly the same. Gotcha. So in order to get to a diagnosis, um, the concept of multidisciplinary diagnosis is developed. So we need a good history. We need a lot of blood tests to look at the serologic evidence for whether any of those connective tissue disorders are available. We need a radiologist who specializes in interstitial lung disease. And we need a pathologist who is an expert in interstitial lung disease. And we all get in the same room and review all the data to get to a final diagnosis. So it's, it's not simple, and it, there are a lot of different aspects to this. Gotcha. In, in terms of treatment, and maybe you can tell us about maybe three common diagnoses. So uh, particularly, I know a lot of people are very interested in IPF and profenadone. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because before you mentioned that 
it's important to have this diagnosis because there's a lot we can do. So what can we and you, what can you do for patients when they come in and are struggling with ILD? So, and I know you're not gonna make it easy. Right. I know it's not yes or no, but please, you know, this is so important and you know, I'm on the boards and I, I see people struggle with these questions over and over again. And I see them on the pulmonary fibrosis boards, I see them on the COPD board, I see them all over. So I, you know, I brought you here because I'm, I want you to shine this light and help us once and for all figure out what, what should we be asking our doctors and what, should we, what information should we be bringing to the medical centers. So the first question is, is the lung disease a disease of a known cause or an unknown? Okay. So that has to do with the categorization of um, occupational related exposures and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And so we take a very detailed history about both occupational exposures and also potential antigenic exposures from birds, from mold, and so forth. And sometimes you really have to dig deeply to figure out that someone is exposed to mold and they don't even realize they're being exposed to mold. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The other, um, in, the, in the other broad category of um, connective tissue disorders, sometimes people come with a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma, but many times we see patients who have an interstitial lung disease that is part of an autoimmune process where the lung is the only organ that's affected by the disease. So in order to get to that diagnosis, we have to send a lot of blood tests to look for autoantibodies that are associated with interstitial lung disease. And then for the idiopathic interstitial lung diseases, that is the category where the cause is completely unknown, we have to correctly classify them as to whether they have something called nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, which is a completely misleading term. It's not nonspecific. There's specific criteria for diagnosing it. And it's not an infection. It's an inflammatory disease. So the only way that we can make that diagnosis is with the surgical lung biopsy I talked about before. And then there's IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So that is dependent on, that is a diagnosis of both inclusion and exclusion. So first we have to exclude all the other categories that I've mentioned. And then the inclusive part of this is to have definitive evidence of the UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, which often requires a surgical lung biopsy. Sometimes we can make that diagnosis just from a high resolution CT but it requires that very specific criteria are all met. So it's the minority of patients who have IPF who can have the diagnosis made just from their history physical and, and CAT scan. So taking all that into account, if we have a, um, an occupational related lung disease, of course, if people still have ongoing exposure to the inciting agent, we advise them that that has to stop. If it's a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, if we can figure out what the antigen is and have them avoid exposure, that's the best treatment. If they're still symptomatic after doing that or we can't figure out what the antigen is, they may require treatment with steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs. In the category of individuals who have connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease, if they have symptoms or their disease is progressive, we will usually be very aggressive about giving them immunosuppressive drugs with the expectation that it's likely they will respond to those drugs. And are those immunosuppressives to treat the disease itself? To treat okay, the to disease stop itself. The to stop, for example, the rheumatoid arthritis from progressing because the rheumatoid arthritis is what's causing the interstitial lung disease. Right. Well, at least to suppress the inflammation that's going on in the lung. Gotcha. And try to reduce the um, production of autoantibodies that are also inciting that inflammation. And does removal of the exposure then stop the progression of the disease? 
it may or may not. It's the best chance of stopping it, but there's no guarantee. Sometimes uh, when these diseases have progressed to a certain point, uh, they will continue to pr progress even when, um, in the case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you're removed from exposure to antigen. But still, the best chance of stabilizing the disease is to remove yourself from exposure. Gotcha. And then in the, the idiopathic diseases, for the disease entity that we call nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, that is very readily responsible, uh, responsive to very high doses of steroids for very long periods of time. And because we know that disease entity is, res is responsive, we're, we're willing to tolerate and to deal with the, all the side effects that those steroids may cause in individuals. Mm -hmm. That's in sharp contrast with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where we now know from a study that we just finished with the Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis Clinical Research Network, which was a multi-center group that was funded by the National Institute of Health, of which I was one of the investigators, mm -hmm. but it was carried out around the country, where we found out that using intensive immunosuppression with prednisone and azathioprine and N-acetylcysteine for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis actually turned out to be causing harm. It wasn't just that it didn't work it actually caused harm. So that's why I'm emphasizing that having the correct diagnosis in the beginning is really important because if we're treating you, we're giving you dangerous drugs. Now, the good news in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is that just this year, the FDA approved two drugs to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, perfenidone and nintenanib. And both of these drugs are pills that you take. Um, they, they do have potentially some significant side effects, but they're not steroids. And both drugs were shown in a large group of subjects who had mild to moderate IPF to slow the progression of the disease. So it's not a cure, doesn't necessarily make you feel better. But over the course of a year, there was better preservation of lung function in people who took these drugs as opposed to people who took the placebo. So these are the first two drugs that have actually been approved for the treatment of IPF, and that's a real um, watershed change in the management of this disease. Okay, I wanna try to just go back a little bit to make sure that I'm clear on, on this. If I'm not mistaken, and please tell me if I'm wrong, the basic breakdown of interstitial lung disease is do we know the cause, do we not know the cause? Right. That's the first level. So if we know the cause, we're looking at things like occupational exposures, exposure to birds, coal miners, farmers who are exposed to grain, um, or another cause like connective tissue disease, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, right. autoimmune diseases. And I should have also mentioned um, drugs can be a cause. Okay, um, so what drugs? The typical, the most common ones that we see are bleomycin, which is used for chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and amiodarone which is used for a variety of cardiac conditions. Um, most, the most common use of it right now is for atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. So those drugs all have their appropriate uses, but and sometimes they cause pulmonary toxicity. Now, it would, let's say amiodarone, which is antiarrhythmic, would that be likely to bring out this lung disease in somebody who's prone to it, or are there people who have no predisposition to this lung disease that can develop it because of amiodarone, or is that unknown? It's unknown. Okay. I, I, I should have known that it was unknown. <laughs> um, okay. And then the other category is idiopathic or unknown origin, and then that breaks down to the nonspecific non pneumonitis. And, the, and that, is that, that's not hypersensitivity pneumonitis, is it? No. Okay. So it's nonspecific and then idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And then it's important to tell the difference between those because the NSIP is going to be treated with, I think you said steroids, NAC, and there was one other drug? No, no, the, the, the NSIP will be treated with, with steroids, high with dose steroids in high dose for a very long period of time. And the prognosis is different than in IPF. I see. It's a lot different. In fact, in NSIP, the, the median survival is probably greater than 10 years. 
Okay. Whereas in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's somewhere between three to five years from the time of from diagnosis. From diagnosis. Okay. Gotcha. So the prognosis is different. The treatment is different because we know that the immunosuppressive drugs do not work in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and they cause harm. Gotcha. So that's why it's super important to get to the right diagnosis at the beginning. Okay, so for patients who maybe suspect that they have pulmonary interstitial lung disease, how important is it for them to get to a medical center at all costs? What, what, how great is that importance? In, in my mind, it's really crucial because I think what uh, I've tried to convince you of is that knowing the diagnosis correctly up front has a major determinant, is the major determinant of what the treatment plan ought to be. <clears throat> so you're not going to be on the right treatment if you don't know what the diagnosis is. And then once that diagnosis is made and the treatment plan is established, how often do you, will you work with the patient's home physician, is that something that's reasonable to do? It's very reasonable, and we do that all the time. So, um, like you, I have a lot of patients who come from far away, and generally, um, that's what people prefer. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I want to take a quick break and go to Bill Vick, and then, Dr. Kane, we're going to bring it back to you also with lifestyle. Um, and, and Chris, we're ready for Bill. Bill, are you, are you with us? I am. I hey, am. Bill. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is also another fascinating individual who I have, uh, believe it or not, had the pleasure to meet through where else but Facebook. Um, and, uh, and, and I had a, a conversation with Bill the other night. This is a very interesting individual. And, and, Bill, if I get any of this wrong, please tell me. But you're 36 years old, right? Um, Bill is actually 76 years old. He's a Marine. Um, he's a, a triathlete. Um, he's about to do a 5K Tough Mudder, and um, and Bill has IPF. So if if nothing else, you know that this guy is tough. And um, I I don't say that what Bill does is going to work for every single one of you. It probably won't. And probably even if I tried to do what Bill did, I would be in the hospital. But Bill, tell us a little bit. I know you have this this lifestyle approach worked out. Before you tell us your lifestyle approach, tell us a little bit about your beginning with IPF. Uh, I will, but first let me say first no to you. Thank you for, for what you're doing here. And Dr. Kaner, you are my hero, truly. Uh, I'm so impressed with everything you've said. It's just, it's awesome. Uh, to give you kind of the 20,000 foot view, I went through what most patients go through. They're diagnosed. I saw multiple, multiple doctors. I went through every atomizer and inhaler known to man. Uh, heard words like asthma, chronic bronchitis for two to three years. So I think I probably have had IPF for, I'm going on my third year now. I've probably had it for five or six. Uh, when I was diagnosed, uh, again, like many patients here, uh, I was given a kind of a dismal prognosis, the three to five year number. And I'd asked my doctors, and I went through five different pulmonologists trying to confirm, well, what do I do? And I kept on hearing, well, anything you want, because there's nothing we can do. So uh, I went to Dr. Google. I did a lot of research. I made a lot of phone calls. I talked to doctors around the world. I talked to people at the NIH, uh, talked to people in China and Germany and in England and uh, roughly 163 different groups of, of support groups around the country, trying to find some button to press or some answer, and I couldn't find any. So I came to some conclusions, which they may not be the right conclusions, but they're the, the conclusions I kind of work with. And those, those conclusions are, first, I, I, I try to treat my IPF. And by the way, I was diagnosed with IPF uh, first at Baylor with a VASC procedure and a high-risk scan. I was diagnosed with a high-risk scan at National Jewish Health along with a week of blood testing that made me totally vampire safe. And then I went uh, for additional testings here in Dallas. So I've gone through uh, lots and lots and lots of tests. I currently go to UT Southwest where I have an excellent doctor, Dr. Christine Garcia. And, uh, but my, my, my handling of my disease, the, what I'm doing, my, the drummer I, I walk to and march to is perhaps different. I treat this as an autoimmune response. So everything I do is geared to tamper down both the external and internal uh, triggers that I might have to an autoimmune disease. We have eliminated all the 
the feathers in the house, the down pillows and bedspreads. We've eliminated uh, any possibilities of mold or fungus. We've taken those steps. We've done all the things that anybody, a prudent person would do externally. Internally, what I found is, is kind of a gap of knowledge. Uh, sure, GERDs is one of the contributing factors that most people accept, and I had GERD, which I've cured, by the way, based on my lifestyle and diet. But uh, also, I don't think enough credence is given to diet and exercise. And so I came up with this kind of a thought process. I call it SPADE, S-P-A-D-E, SPADE. And that stands for, uh, S for support. I think that support of others to impact your attitude and the way you approach life in this disease is important. Uh, prayer, for me, it's an important piece. Uh, and it's not a religious piece, per se, as much as uh, perhaps reaching out beyond yourself or other help. Uh, a for attitude. I think attitude is critically important in my approach. Uh, diet. Uh, people like to talk about diet because it's a controllable, easy to control factor. For me, it's a real simple one. Uh, I follow a diet called the paleo diet or the primal diet. I've eliminated wheat and grains out of my diet. I've eliminated milk out of my diet, both of which, by the way, contribute to leaky gut. Leaky gut in turn forces uh, an autoimmune response to the body, so I've eliminated that and stopped that. And exercise, I, I really feel and believe in my heart of hearts, along with a lot of doctors in China, that you can increase the efficiency of the lungs with exercises, breathing exercises, qigong, uh, running, stressing your, your body to a point and that take a little bit farther than that each time you work out and exercise. So to answer your question, uh, those are the things I do. I approach it from a lifestyle perspective. Uh, I've not only stabilized my disease where my my raw stats haven't changed in three years, but I've actually shown some improvement. My oxygen efficiency is better now. I, I hover somewhere around 98 to 99 percent when I'm sitting still. When I work out, I might drop down to the low 90s. Uh, my DLCO has gone from where it was, which is about 82 percent, to now 104 percent. My FVC went from 78 percent to 116 percent. And those are meaningful numbers to me that don't tell me I've gotten rid of the disease, I know I haven't. The reality is it's there, and it's kind of like riding a bicycle down a hill. You know, it's going to have some bumps and smooth spots, but eventually you go down the bottom regardless. And I recognize that. While I'm on that ride, I'm taking that bike ride down that hill, it's going to be the best ride I can take, and I'm going to take it as well as I can. So that's kind of how I approach it, and the short version of my, my diagnosis and prognosis. Bill, what I find so interesting about you, um, amongst many things, but, um, you know, you've kind of come to this on your own in a very short period of time, and we have a lot of the same beliefs in terms of exercise, nutrition, stress management. Um, how did you come to this? Like, what, what were the things that were telling you it was your diet or your leaky gut? When, you, when you're motivated by a fact you're going to die in three years, you're motivated beyond the normal person. Uh, you do this because it's your business, your job, your profession. I do it because I want to live. And so I've got pretty high motivations. And, and Dr. Kano, what do you think, um, like, Bill is obviously the outlier, the exception. And I think, you know, so much of it has to do with the fact that he's been a lifelong athlete. He's able to make these changes. Um, how much does lifestyle play in, in your treatment and in your, your care of patients? And, and how many of our patients can expect to see similar results to Bill? Well, first of all, I, I have a lot of respect for what he's done, and the, the numbers in his pulmonary function test speak for themselves, so you can't argue with success. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there are some lifestyle things that everyone can do, mm -hmm. even if they can't, you know, go on a paleo diet and, and um, exercise uh, to the extent that he has. But everyone can control reflux whether they do it by diet, by lifestyle, um, by medication. There's some way, or even sometimes by surgery, there's always a way to control reflux. So that's something everyone can do. Everyone can exercise. And as you know very well, even people who have reasons that they may not be able to run or walk, they might be able to exercise on a bicycle, they might be able to do arm exercises. Mm -hmm. So there's always a way to get someone to exercise. And Absolutely. in this disease, um, 
having a regular exercise routine that gets you out of a deconditioned state and into a more well-conditioned state is very important. And so those two things, I think, are simple things that everyone can do. In terms of the autoimmune basis for IPF, um, I think that there is a lot of scientific evidence to support um, the idea that at least some, at least in, in a subgroup of people, there is some type of autoimmune phenomena that's driving the injury in the lung, that's initiating the process. Now, how diet and exercise interplay with that autoimmune process is really an area that hasn't been explored at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have a lot to learn from you, uh, Mr. Vick, in terms of your approach and what the scientific basis is for those interventions that you um, use have on the pathophysiology of the disease. So that would be an area that just hasn't been explored yet. Mm -hmm. You know, an interesting thing, Dr. Kean, you know, that's, I, I think it's interesting. I've identified now around the world two other people that are having the same exact results I am and are doing much of the same things. One's in Germany. She's a triathlete. She runs 10Ks with her oxygen tank. She's a mountain climber. She's a biker. She's really athletic and active. Her diet is not that dissimilar from mine. And I found another one in Atlanta, Georgia, similar. So I found two other people that are doing similar things and getting similar results. One of the advantages I think I had in my diagnosis was because I was an athlete, I was sensitive to my body in the way it performed. So when I was short of breath, I immediately went to my doctor, not because I was sick, because it, it impacted my training and my times. I wasn't going as fast or as long. So I went, to, I went in very early in the process, and I think that's a big reason why I've had the success I've had with this lifestyle approach. You know, one of the things that I say all the time is that when, you know, when we first started seeing pulmonary fibrosis patients in 1995, a lot of times they were disqualified from the program because they were told they were too sick or their saturation was too low or we couldn't keep them saturated with six liters. I don't want people to watch this and be scared off by Bill's story because he is so athletic. We see the same type of things with people in their 70s and 80s if we can give you as much oxygen as possible and exercise you vigorously. A lot of times I think people with pulmonary fibrosis or any interstitial lung disease are in a tough spot because a lot of times clinicians are afraid to, to work them hard or let them go to certain perspectives. Um, you know, Bill, I, I suspect you wouldn't, if someone told you you couldn't be active, I don't, I don't have the idea that you would be following that advice. Well, I, you know, the, the, failure is not an option, nor is uh, not being active. So. Exactly. Um, now, I have another question because Bill, Bill has mentioned this, but if you look at the classic literature about pulmonary rehab, they will say patients feel better, they are less short of breath, but there's no improvement in pulmonary function. Do you think there can be, or how do you explain Bill's results? Because we've also seen a lot of patients with improvements in pulmonary function. What is your take on that? Um, it, it's hard to know. I mean, there hasn't, there hasn't been a um, convincing randomized trial that would prove, you know, beyond any scientific doubt that pulmonary function can improve. But it certainly doesn't get worse, mm -hmm. and there's no question that you can improve your exercise performance, um, even if your pulmonary function doesn't improve. I mean, there are specific examples where pulmonary function in interstitial lung disease really does improve. Um, they're not necessarily an IPF, but for example, in scleroderma-related interstitial lung disease, it can, there can be an improvement in the actual lung tissue itself, but there can also be an improvement in the compliance of the chest wall, because people with scleroderma are also limited by the, the tightness of the skin in their chest. So if that improves, it allows better lung compliance because their chest walls will be better. So I think that improvements in the bellows function of your lung will certainly cause an improvement in your measured pulmonary function, even if the interstitial part of your lung hasn't changed very much. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Bill, I have another question for you. Um, you mentioned um, when you were first diagnosed, you were misdiagnosed, you were given a lot of treatments that didn't work. 
Was there first a big decline before you sort of stopped yourself from falling and picked up again? What, like, how bad did it get for you? Uh, it got bad enough where uh, instead of swimming 3,000 yards for a workout, I could barely do 50. It got to the point where instead of running five and six miles, I had a hard time uh, walking around our local shopping mall without stopping. Uh, my, when I was tested, I was at about 78% of FEC. I had lost a lot because I typically was over 100 in, in previous tests before diagnosis. So I think my being in condition uh, has a lot to do with the, the, where I'm at today. And I think there's many people uh, like me, however, if they catch it early. And my, my whole mission in life is, is twofold. First is to raise awareness for early diagnosis. I think it's the key. And as Dr. Kaner said, diagnosis at a, at a center that has the resources, tools, and people and knowledge to give an accurate diagnosis. And secondly, I want to inspire patients. Uh, use me as an example or what I'm doing is, is kind of your own goal. But I think people can improve their lung efficiency and live a better life. And sure, this stuff isn't going to go away. That's the reality. But you know what? While you're living, live. And uh, until I find that uh, tattoo on my bottom where God tattooed it, I don't have an expiration date, and I'm going to live every day the best I can. Mm -hmm. Bill, um, you know, in our ultimate pulmonary wellness protocol, I really attribute nutrition, diet, stress management as being very equal in terms of their, their benefit to people. Do you, of your spade, is there, I know you're a huge exercise fan, do you find them all sort of equal or would you rank them in terms of, if you're going to give somebody one piece of advice, what do you, what do you recommend people change right now? I think it's a hard answer. I, I think that the three givens that must be there, I think, are don't excaporate things with diet. If, if leaky gut really is a contributor for some people, then don't irritate it. Don't eat those things that can cause your body to react and, and treat your, your eating uh, an invader, uh, so to speak. I say diet is very, really important, but exercise too. You know, you can have a great diet and not exercise, and it's not going to really help in my mind. And I've seen people that have a great exercise but don't eat well, and I don't think they have the same progress either. So it's a, it's a combination. And then you have to wrap around all of that attitude. If you don't have the right attitude, you're not going to do the diet or the exercise, and you're just, I don't think you're going to do as well. It's hard to measure those things. You know, how do you measure that stuff? How do you measure someone's attitude in, in those things? Well, I, I think those are all great points. I'd, I'd like to bring up another concept that can link diet with autoimmunity. So there's now um, a lot of interest in the research community on the microbiome. So those are the bacterial organisms that live in your intestine and in your mouth and in your lung that are not causing overt infection, but still they're having influences on your immune system. And now it's been pretty well established that that's very important in um, inflammatory bowel diseases. But the immune system uh, encompasses the whole body. So if there's if the microbiome is influencing the immune system in your gut and you have a lung disease, maybe that's going to also have an impact on your lung disease. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a plausible scientific hypothesis that can link dietary changes to changes in your immune system. So that's something that, that's an area that is ripe for scientific exploration right now and we really need to learn a lot more about that. And on One your thing on the microbiome, I think, is, uh, is, which is, has to do with probiotics, I currently drink a gallon of kefir a week. Purely because it's, it's probably one of the best probiotics known, and it has 12 lactobacillus, whereas yogurt only has 10, and those extra two have the ability to adhere to the intestine wall. And I think the microbiome piece is really important. It is for me. Dr. Kano, who who's going to handle that on your team? Is that a gastroenterologist who specializes also in interstitial lung disease, or are the pulmonologists going to do that as well? Well, this is this is a uh, um, this is where the idea of having multi multidisciplinary research teams is really important. So, um, as pulmonologists, we're interesting interested in investigating lung disease, but we may need microbiome experts to to um, partner with us um, 
and collaborate on trying to tease out uh, what the important uh, microbiome connections are with interstitial lung disease. And that's an area that we're actually very interested in exploring in, in the near future. There's one other comment I wanted to make about um, the possible improvements in pulmonary function and how that could come sure. about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I don't know if this has any relevance to your case. I don't know your, your personal medical records. Um, but just as a concept, as a theoretical concept, one of the things that happens that we've learned in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but also in some other interstitial lung diseases, is that you can have something called an acute exacerbation. So that's where, over a short period of time, your symptoms get much worse, you become more breathless, your oxygen requirement for supplemental oxygen goes up, you feel sick, and it generally requires medical attention. It's a major event, and there's a big deterioration in your lung function. That's caused by an acute lung injury that's superimposed over the background of pulmonary fibrosis. And we can see that on a CAT scan where we see new areas of what the radiologist calls ground glass opacity. So these are like amorphous white spots in the CAT scan that appear in the lungs um, superimposed on the background of scarring. Those sometimes can progress and lead to death and sometimes they can get better. So in people where they get better, their lung function, if, if they're diagnosed at the time that they have an acute exacerbation, and they get over that acute exacerbation, their lung function will actually improve. I'm not saying that's what happened to you, Mr. Vick, but I'm just saying that that's another explanation for how lung function could improve in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Let me ask you this, and, and maybe this is my own fantasy, but I kind of view the role of exercise in lung function as if you think of the lung as a candle and we heat it up and we stretch it out, if, you know, we exercise people much more vigorously than the average program. And it, part of that is that I feel that by getting this huge pump, we're able to, you know, either, I don't want to say break up scar tissue, but maintain that elasticity so people can keep those volumes. Is that possible or is that... I think that's something that has never really been looked at very carefully um, because very few people push people to the level of exercise that you do in your program and Mr. Vic does in his own personal program. So I think that's something that really needs to be investigated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go to some questions from the home studio audience now and I, I want to bring, um, if Melissa is there, and Melissa, we're going to unmute you in a second if, so you can ask the question yourself. Melissa, can you hear us? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I was just asking uh, what happens if, if you still don't have a clear diagnosis even after a VATS biopsy? Well, <clears throat> that's a great question. And, uh, a lung biopsy is only part of the picture, as I was trying to explain before. So it really takes a multidisciplinary discussion between a clinician, a pathologist, and a radiologist to get to a final multidisciplinary uh, diagnosis. And I think right. if you if you don't have a diagnosis at that point. Um, it's reasonable to get another opinion from, you know, another expert in the field because this is an area of medicine that is um, not always cut and dried, and you may get slightly different answers um, from different centers. So there's nothing wrong with getting a second opinion. Okay. Oh, what happened? Did you? Did no, you're with us. Okay. Did, did, okay. Sorry. To... Uh, Okay, yeah, I just, because I, I, I'm i in Buffalo, New York, so, uh, you know, a few hours from Cornell, but I did push to go to Cleveland, and I and I don't feel like they used any kind of multidisciplinary approach, and, and I still don't have a clear-cut clear diagnosis, and I, I'm just wondering if things would be, um, you know, very different if I had one. So that was what my question was about. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I, wa I want to just say um, that, 
and it's a request, and I, I should have really said this before, but if it's, if it's, I don't mind talking about people's cases, and I want people to ask specific questions, but if we can maybe, unless you want to praise your doctor to high heaven, um, I think it's best if we leave specific medical centers or physicians' names out of it. Um, and I want to move on to um, Mr. Uh, to Ron, if you're with us. And Ron, we're going to unmute you. I am here. Ron, and this is our this is our new sound system. So I hope you guys are all enjoying it. I love hearing people's voices, especially the Southerners. Um, Ron, go for it. Who is who is your question for? Uh, my question is is for anyone who can answer it. I'm wondering if, in fact, there are stages to IPF, uh, such as there are with cancer. You know, being stage one, two, three, four, whatever. I'm going to vote for Dr. Kaner to answer this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that question. There isn't a strict staging system. Um, the reason that there are staging systems in cancer is because the prognosis and the treatment really changes with the stage of the cancer. And in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we don't really have anything analogous to that. What, what I will tell you is that um, we generally think about people as having either mild, moderate, or severe idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And mild is people that are very functional, they can work, they go about their daily activities, but they notice some symptoms. But it doesn't have a huge impact on their lifestyle. People that are severe have a lot of difficulty moving around. They may only be able to move for a few steps. Um, they're very impaired. Um, they really can't do anything. It's very similar to someone who's in class four heart failure, to use that mm -hmm. analogy. And then people that are moderate are, are in between. They may have some impairment. They may, require, they may or may not require oxygen for walking. Um, but they're able to do a certain amount of exercise. And it may not be what they want to do, but they can do some. And, you know, and then there are very many shades in between. Um, but that doesn't really um, tell you uh, very much about prognosis and treatment. But th that's what that's how we think about um, classifying people with IPF. But there are a number of different ways of doing that. There's symptoms. There's lung function. There's exercise ability. There's whether or not you need oxygen and how much you need. Um, there's the amount of change that there's been in your lung function, those um, can all affect your prognosis. But right now, we don't have a whole lot of stage-specific treatments for it. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your question, Ron. Um, Bill, I have a question for you from uh, Dr. Stephen Edorian. And the question is, how long have you been on the paleo diet for? Uh, three years. Three years. OK. Um, I have a, a, a question now. Let's go to um, a question from, uh, I'm sorry, um, Sharon. And Sharon, this is also for you, Bill. The, the gallon of something that you drink per day, I think you said it was kefir, correct? It's a gallon a week. A, a, a gallon, gallon a week. day, I'd, uh, I'd be kind of stumbling <laughs> when walking, but yes. Okay, so <laughs> don't drink a gallon a day. Drink a gallon a week of kefir. Okay, excellent. Um, I have a question now from Barbara, and Barbara, are you with us? Barbara, is that you? Mute that. Yep, let's mute that. Okay, so I'm going to ask Bar Barbara a question. Uh, actually, Barbara's making a comment. She's saying acute exacerbations knock her down, then with exercise. Six months later, she's back to almost pre-exacerbation levels. Um, and is that something, how, how often do people come back from an exacerbation, and, and what are the keys to that? Well, unfortunately, it, it's the minority of people who come back to pre-exacerbation levels. <clears throat> so we, we know from um, all the data that we collected in the IPFNet studies that after an acute exacerbation, um, about 
there's about a 50% mortality rate three months after an wow. exacerbation. So, and of those who survive, not everyone gets back to their pre-exacerbation level of lung function. So if she's been able to do that, that's, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, Bill, I know that you have to go. I want to I thank you for being here. Um, as I said, I mean, I, I find you so fascinating. I really want to bring you to New York where our team can poke and prod you and we'll bring Dr. Kaner in for the festivities. Um, is there anything you want to leave us with on, on a final note, Bill? Just uh, my, my gratitude for both of you for what you're doing and, uh, and it's all for a word of hope for the patients that are listening and the caregivers. We're all in this fight together. We're all brothers and sisters in the fight and I'm totally open and accessible to anybody if I can help them or talk to them or in any way, shape or form advise them. I'm here for that. That's great. Thank you so much, Bill. You have a good evening and uh, we're going to do about 15 more minutes of questions if they're out there. And the next question is going to be from Anja. Anja, are you with us? Anja? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Right. I've got actually two questions. Um, first question, I often hear people saying that they had a rat biopsy and got a diagnosis, and then a few years later they had another one and then got a different diagnosis. So I actually wonder, do these diseases sort of change into each other, and how common is that? Um, that's a great question, and it's it's actually really complicated. So, so if I understand your your question correctly, it's can these diagnoses change over time uh, for interstitial lung disease? And I think the best answer is most of the time no, but yes, there are examples where that could happen. So, um, for example, there are some individuals who have a surgical lung biopsy where they have the NSIP, the nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern in one lobe, and the UIP, the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, in another lobe. Oh. So that particular constellation of findings has been labeled discordant UIP. And in those individuals, they have an outcome that really looks more like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So in some individuals, the NSIP pattern and the UIP pattern can coexist, but the prognosis really depends on the presence of the UIP pattern. There are also, uh, one thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet is th there are also our families that um, have a lot of interstitial lung disease. So for example, there are families where several close family members all have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now that's a, a small minority, it's probably between 5 and 10 percent of individuals who have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but in those families, not everyone gets the same interstitial lung disease. Wow. So there are families where some individuals have IPF, some have chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and others have NSIP. So that wasn't exactly the question you asked, but it's, a, it's an interesting observation. So there's definitely a genetic component to many of these interstitial lung diseases. And for the, the um, situation that we talked about before, of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, very typically, if there's been uh, a whole family that's been exposed to the same antigens, mm -hmm. very typically only one individual will develop the disease. So obviously the genetic predisposition is an important factor in who ends up with the, with the disease. So now, this is where I think we can really make a giant impact right now. For everybody listening that has an interstitial lung disease, what family members need to get tested and what do they need to get tested for? Well, that um, testing of family members hasn't, in terms of the genetic testing, hasn't become a, uh, a commonplace um, clinical test that you can easily do. But there are a number of research centers um, around the country, for example, at Vanderbilt and National Jewish, where they have ongoing research projects of familial interstitial lung disease. Um, but certainly, for people that have a family member who has interstitial lung disease and they want to know if they have an early interstitial lung disease, um, it's reasonable to go to your, to your doctor, 
have your chest listened to, um, at least get a chest x-ray to see if there are some very early changes um, that would be uh, that would be observable with a minimal amount of radiation. To really do the most sensitive test for interstitial lung disease, it's a high resolution chest CT. And are there, um, is that a reasonable test if you have no symptoms or is it something to say maybe I'll get a chest x-ray now but in five years I'll get? Well, I think it's a, it's a discussion that you need to have with your doctor because I think every situation really has to be individualized. Gotcha, okay, great. Um, David, are you with us? David, can you hear me? Let's see if we can hear you. David? You guys got anything? No? David, can you speak for us, please? David B, is your microphone turned on? I think we're... No? Okay, let's go on. Okay, if anybody has any other questions, please type them in. Uh, and I have a, a question from now, uh, I'm going to try to say, Sirisha, Sirisha, are, she's off, okay, gotcha, 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 okay. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, um, I want to try to summarize and, and, and First, I want to thank you, Dr. Kaner. Of course, this was, again, taking a complex topic and breaking it down as simply as we can. Um, any last points you want to give, the one-two punch that people should walk away from this with? Well, I think if um, you learned anything from what I had to say tonight, the importance of having the right diagnosis early in the process is really key. Absolutely. So um, I hope that that will be the take-home message. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, as always, again, for those of you that voted in the blog contest, we came in second, but we are still the winners, and we are going to capitalize on this uh, on a go-forward basis. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Next month, we have another giant of medicine coming to us, Dr. Evelyn Horn, who is one of the top, top pulmonary hypertension and heart failure people in the country that is going to be sitting in win with us. And again, this is not the usual ultimate pulmonary wellness. This is graduate level ultimate pulmonary wellness here. And, you know, I love the opportunity to always be the dumbest person in the room in these webinars. And I thank you so much for joining us and have a great evening. And thank you so much to Bill Vick and to Dr. Robert Kaner. Thanks, Noah. Photo shoot fresh. Looking like well. I'm about to call the paparazzi. On myself. Kaner, Greenspan, out.